dum 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 there's a stain on my garment dear aisha dear aisha there's a stain on my garment dear aisha a stain tell me how did it get there mohammed mohammed tell me how did it get there mohammed tell me sexy slave girls dear aisha dear aisha dear aisha sexy slave girls dear aisha i just lost control there's maria al kuptia rayana bin Syed, um ayman and others you know i can't wait the bilal's calling out son mohammed mohammed now it's time for the salad mohammed it's time then scrape it dear aisha dear aisha dear aisha then scrape it dear aisha dear aisha scrape it sahih muslim five seven two three three seven seven surah sixty six al bukhari two three two surah four twenty four Is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Hallelujah. Let Lord Jesus Christ shine forth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Welcome to the live stream with PCCI Ministries. And tonight I have the privilege of having the author of the Quran with me. Peace of Christ be with you, Robert Spencer. How are you? and with your spirit very well thank you and you by god's grace i'm good thank you um how are you doing okay uh ready to talk quran ready to break open the uh the 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 the, the, the perfect book the inviolable mother of the book that has existed for all eternity in paradise with the law so he had something to read while he was there all alone and uh what can i tell you about it so uh what the plan is uh, so while robert is the author of the quran we are gonna talk about <laughs> talk about his perfect book and plan is having series almost every week by god's grace unless lord takes us home or something happens having series every week looking at the surahs their background and then what does it tell us so uh by the time we finish all of the quran hopefully you will have a, a channel where you can go and then just like okay let me get background of that surah what does it tell us and then what we can learn how we can use it in our evangelism so that's the plan so we are planning to do this for 114 surahs of the quran and today it's going to be like intro and then um get on with it um just a practical question before we start robert um you said that um it is the mother of the book and then also you express that it is a book that he can read it while he's there what what did you mean with that there are three eternal things in Islam. Interestingly enough, since there's been the recently the great debate on the Trinity and all kinds of discussion about the various parts of Allah and how they relate to the idea that he is an absolute unity. And so it's interesting to note that not only Allah, but the book and the throne are eternal. And so he's always sitting there 
and he always has his book to read. But uh, nobody says, of course, that this means that there are three gods in Islam, but there are three eternal things. And mm -hmm. so uh, these are apparently not part of Allah, but something else. Hello from Georgia. My goodness. I've been to Georgia, Atlanta. Uh, no, that's, sorry, wrong Georgia. I anyway, uh, the uh, Quran is supposed to be the perfect copy of the perfect book, and the eternal book. And the eternal book, of course, is called Umm al-Kitab, the mother of the book, and the uh, copy is the Quran that is perfectly transmitted, <laughs> as you well know, so that it has no errors and is the perfect, every copy in the whole world that you pick up is exactly the same, and they are all copies of the mother of the book that Allah has in paradise. Can I ask, um, can I just challenge what you said? Um, challenge? Why, that would be heretical. We would have to behead you. So you said, uh, before the everything, you've got Allah, his throne, and his eternal word, his book, yes. mother of the book he's reading. How did, the, like, my understanding is Quran has lots of grammatical mistakes. Allah is not, like, very confident about his pronouns. Um, Allah doesn't remember well uh, how he revealed the thing stuff. How did you come to the conclusion that Allah can read and write? Oh, that's a good question. That's an excellent question because Muhammad is famously illiterate in Islamic tradition, although, of course, as you know, well know, that's disputed, and it may just mean that uh, he is influenced by people who do not speak Arabic. But in any case, uh, Muhammad, you're suggesting that not only is Muhammad illiterate, but Allah. And that would be actually in keeping with the uh, nature of the Quran, because uh, you're correct. It contains numerous grammatical errors and... Uh, statements that just cannot be explained on the face of them as coming from a perfect and eternal being. If Allah wants to write in Arabic, why doesn't he write in grammatical Arabic? Why does he make grammatical mistakes? Especially when it cannot be said that any of the grammatical mistakes add some kind of meaning to the book. They're simply mistakes. In other words, it's not as if by making an intentional grammatical error, Allah is making some esoteric point that would not otherwise be clear. There's, it, it, there's no point to it at all. And so it does, uh, in itself, the grammatical errors explode the divine nature of the Quran. And so in all seriousness, in the critical Quran, I did not include all of the grammatical errors or all of the variants, because uh, I wanted it to be a book that was easily usable by readers who know no Arabic at all. And so I didn't want to have long explanations of Arabic grammar and in it and so on, but there are nonetheless quite a few of these errors and variant readings pointed out. And even one of them, no matter how minor, destroys the whole idea of the Quran because why would there be variations in the perfect and eternal book? And of course, the classic ex uh, explanation for that in Islamic tradition is that uh, Allah revealed the Quran in differing Arabic dialects, but there's no way that you could actually look at the variations and the grammatical errors and ascribe them honestly to dialectical variants because they're just not those kinds of errors. Uh, recognized Arabic dialects have particular ways of speaking that do not correspond to the errors and variants in the Quran. So um, for, for Quran to be revealed in different dialects, is it not correct that the script needs to have the dots? And they didn't have dots in the time of se in 7th century when so-called Quran revealed in seven different dialects. The importance of this cannot be overstated. And I think it can be difficult for people who know nothing about Arabic to understand it. It's very important to understand what Hatun is talking about in regard to the dots. Uh, Arabic has 22 letters, and 16 of them are just like other letters of the alphabet. 
except for dots that go above or below, diacritical marks, they're called, that go above or below the letter so that you can tell which letter it is. And yet the original, the oldest Quran manuscripts do not have any of those marks. And that means that even just distinguishing between a B and a T or an R and a Z or other letters that are the same in the Arabic alphabet is impossible because you're just guessing as to what letter is actually being used. And so here we see that... Uh, this, not, is just, yes. this is just an example of uh, Birmingham folios. Um, so I was looking at it earlier. Here's the manuscripts. And when you look at it, there is no dot. So therefore, for example, that you may be distressed can be written as well as pronounced or said as you may be healed. Um, that's just one of the example of that. If you look closely, even if you don't know Arabic, you can do this. If you look closely at the Arabic words there, you can see that there are two dots over the loop. It's off the screen now. Yeah, move it just a little bit over. Yes, down a little bit. Sorry, I'm making you do all this. That's fine. <laughs> we did not, this is not rehearsed, ladies and gentlemen. Just, can it go just, yeah, there you go. Okay, okay, so you see in the first line, you see that the first few letters are the same, but then there's the loop. That's a Q or cough. And it's got the two dots over it that shows you that it's a Q because in the other version, the first three letters are the same. You see they're identical, but then that is an F with just one letter over it. And so only one dot over it. So the difference between the one dot and the uh, two dots means that it's a Q or an F in Arabic. And that means the difference between the word meaning distressed and meaning yield. And this is supposed to be the perfect and eternal book. This is what makes for all the variants in how it can be understood that are quite even aside from actual textual differences between different manuscripts. See, this manuscript would be exactly the same, whether that's a Q or an F. And it's only by the dots that you know how to understand it. But there are other manuscripts that actually have different words altogether. And so this is very clearly a human book and uh, one of a very uh, questionable moral evaluation uh, and not at all a divine book, not remotely a, a divine book that is perfect, the perfect and eternal words of the creator of the universe. Uh, there would not be this variation or these... Uh, differences in the basic text if that were the case yeah so um here i've got another example um another manuscripts eighth century uh you can still see we don't have the dots and then it's difficult to kind of figure out which letter it is and then on the side of it uh you can see the current alphabet like half people are guessing what it is mm -hmm. uh, it's very very different than um what it was so um because anyway. not only note also you see these little things in certain little ovals yeah those are the verse numbers being delineated and that's not in the text either and so not that's and and so often that is a stop a pause in the text of a, a, a sentence ending not always but often and so you have not only the letters being distinguished but the punctuation. And so that means that you could take this text in any number of different ways that depend entirely on how you place the diacritical marks of the dots and what you how you decide what letters go. See, this is this is the foundation for the extraordinary theories of the scholar Christoph Luxemburg, who I use in my books, Did Muhammad Exist? and now in Muhammad, a critical biography, as well as in the critical Quran, uh, Luxembourg takes the earliest manuscripts. He doesn't use the dots that are for the Arabic text of the Quran because as we were just saying, those are not in the original manuscripts. And he adds in diacritical marks as if these were Aramaic writings and not Arabic ones. 
And he says that this actually clarifies a lot of the strange passages of the Quran that don't seem to make any sense or say something very odd, that actually these were Aramaic Christian texts that were repointed, that were given different dots by the authors of the Quran in order to create this Arabic holy text, but that originally the meaning was quite different in the Christian context. And that's where you get the idea of the raisins instead of the huris, the virgins of paradise, that it's not that the text originally said raisins or rightly understood said raisins or something like that. What it is is in the Aramaic text, it was talking about the garden, like the Garden of Eden as the Garden of Paradise and talking about what people, the blessed would enjoy there, including raisins. And that word was was used in the Arabic text, repointed in the Arabic text to refer to the virgins. Yeah. So he, I, I, all those different letters, how they look the same in yeah. Arabic. And that's why you have to have the points. Yeah. Without dots, you wouldn't know what is ta, ta, ba. Without dots, you don't know like which is zai or ra. Um, so you need these lovely dots. Maybe in our daily life, those dots are not very important, but for Quran to be Quran, those yeah. dots are essential. Indeed. And I guess that was the point of, um, as you were expressing Quran, um, dialect of the Quran. So practically in seventh century, um, Quran wouldn't be able to written down with the different dialects. No, it, it, it's just an absurd argument that depends on people not knowing how the language, the basic things about how the language works, because it wouldn't matter. It's not the matter of different dots that make for the variations in the Quran. It's a matter of the fact that there was no dots at all. And so there's a kind of a freewheeling uh, uncertainty about what the basic text says, not just different versions of, 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 what is being said that are based on how people pronounce words differently or things like that, which is what Islamic apologists like to say today. Okay, so, so far um, you expressed that um, Quran is eternal being. It was with Allah before there was anything. Allah, his throne and the Quran. Um, and you expressed that in his free time, Allah is just spending time to read the Quran, all that. Um, you talked about how um, Quran uh, comes from like Allah doesn't come up with one story but you've got the different versions of that story with lots of grammatical mistakes and we've got someone who kind of listening all this and without any shame he wants to invite people to Islam all I can well, say is listen to the word invite people to fantasy and falsehood and taking good for evil and evil for good and killing people and thinking you're offering service to God, then yes, Islam is for you. Yeah, not for us, not for us at all. Okay, so um, what else essential we need to know about um, Quran? As okay, we the Quran also, let, let, let's do one other thing before we get into it. Muhammad is supposed to have started getting the Quran in the year 610. And by the year 632, he had all of it. He did not have it written down, however, because remember, he's supposed to have been illiterate. And so there were different Muslims who had parts of it memorized. And some people who had all of it memorized, supposedly. But the stories about in the Islamic traditions about the comp compilation of the Quran don't make any sense. In the first place, there are two versions. In the first one, Abu Bakr, uh, the caliph after Muhammad died, he recognizes that the Quran is going to be lost. And so he gets Zayd ibn Tabit to get together all of the people who have portions of the Quran memorized so that he can collect the text together. And Zayd ibn Tabit does this, and it's painstaking work. Now, what's funny about this story is why didn't he just get hold of somebody who had the whole Quran memorized and have him recite it all and write it down? But that doesn't seem to have occurred to anybody, even though they say there were people who had the whole thing memorized. Zayd apparently had to get people, a lot of people together 
to get the whole Quran down. And so he did so. And then when he had it all finished, he gave the Quran, the copy, the, the, the mushaf, the copy that he had made to Hafsa, one of Muhammad's wives. And that was that. And then later on, after Abu Bakr died and Umar was caliph for 10 years and Umar died, Uthman decided to collect the Quran. And he didn't say, hey, let me go get Hafsa's edition of the Quran. He didn't seem to know that Hafsa had made an edition of the Quran. And he called Zayd ibn Tabit. What a coincidence. And got him to compile the Quran. Now, the point that I'm making here, one of the many, is that these are obviously, these are ninth century stories. And they are obviously just that, stories. Because what we really have are just two versions of how the thing was put together. There's no reason why Zaid would have had to do the whole job twice. And why, if he had done it once, didn't Uthman just go get his work and work from that? But instead, there are two versions of the story, one that Abu Bakr collected the Quran and another that Uthman collected the Quran, but both feature Zaid ibn Tabit doing the work. Now, it's clear that there were, these stories were, were just two variants of the same story. And it's the same thing as with Quran variants. You have variants in the Hadith that make, di <laughs> that make different versions. So anyway, the story is that Uthman got the Quran from Zayd ibn Tabit, and he burned all the variants in the year 653, and the Quran has been the same ever since. Okay. Now, the problem with that is that nobody mentions it. For the rest of the 7th century... Nobody ever says, hey, we have this Quran that, that comes from Muhammad and is the perfect word of Allah. It, nobody gives any, uh, impre any idea that they have it. Um, okay, I've got a couple of questions regarding. So, sake of the argument, I'm going to think traditional account is correct. And if you can fill me in, that will be kind of helpful. So, who is Zaid bin Tabit? Where He's this guy comes from? What is his connection with um, Abu Bakr or Uthman? Uh, well, he was just one of the early Muslims, and he was known to be a scholar, known to be somebody who had a had a good mind, and so he was chosen for this. There wasn't anything particular about him that I recall, unless it's something I'm forgetting. But I think that he just was picked for this job because it was considered that he would do it well. And it's remarkable that both of them would pick the same guy to do the same job without recognizing that it had already been done the second time. Um, so what I'm hearing from you is Zaid bin Tabit didn't have good memory because he could simply tell Uthman, oh, boss, just a moment, I've done this work a couple of years ago, here right. is the work. So he didn't have very good memory to put that together. <laughs> Am I correct to remember also some of the uh, companions of Muhammad were not happy with Zaid bin Tabit to compile the Quran because um, he didn't, uh, like, he kind of joined in the club a little bit late. There were Muslims who already memorized, like, 70, 70 chapters before um, Zaid bin Tabit uh, stepped in. Yes. And so there were rivals who also collected the Quran, like Abdullah ibn Masood and others. And so it may be that this is why we have variants to this day, that what is being referred to in Islamic tradition when they say that there were other people who collected the Quran is exactly that, that there were other people who collected the Quran. But nobody seems to have done it in the 7th century. It seems as if the variants come later, uh, in the 8th and 9th century in particular, and that the Quran is not as early as it is claimed. It certainly wasn't finished by 632 or compiled by 653, or if there was, it was the world's best-kept secret. Uh, if it was, it was the world's best-kept secret, because... Nobody ever talks about it. And the, while the Muslims are, or the Arabs in, in reality, are conquering North Africa and the Middle East and Persia and uh, Sindh in India, they are having extensive dealings with the non-Muslims that they conquer, and they never tell them that they have this perfect holy book and never tell them any part of it. It's remarkable. 
And then in the early 700s, when the thing is supposed to have been settled for 50 years, we still have John of Damascus saying, yes, John of Damascus being a Christian writer in the early 700s. And he says, yes, I've read the Quran and I've read Surah al-Baqarah as if they're two different books. When nowadays we think of Surah al-Baqarah as chapter two of the Quran. And so it's clear that John of Damascus in the early 700s does not have the Quran the way we have it today. The Surah al-Baqarah wasn't in it. And there's a Hadith that's from 100 years after that that says that the order of the surahs comes from the angel Gabriel. And so it cannot be changed. It's extraordinarily important. And it goes the Fatiha, chapter 1, and then Surah al-Baqarah, chapter 2, and then Anissa, and then Ahlal Imran. And see, that's, that's chapter 4 and chapter 3 in reverse order. Yeah. Why would they make that kind of a mistake if they'd already had the Quran for 150 years? Plus, if it has been arranged by heavenly beings. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> why did they uh, even invent such traditions if there weren't fluidity in the Quran, even at the time of the Hadith being distributed in the ninth century? And that's that's 200 years after the Quran is supposed to have been settled. Okay. Um, so um, I'll just summarize what I heard from you in a sense. Those are the questions I will ask my Muslim friends um, who kind of follow the traditional account. Uh, you expressed that there were people who memorized the Quran, um, yet uh, Zayd bin Tabit needed to go around and then find and then put the Quran together. He did the same job twice. Um, also, if I remember correctly, like his first version of the Quran, um, and the second version of the Quran is not exactly the same because he forgets like end of Surah 9. That's right. Somebody comes rushing up while he's doing it the second time and says, wait, wait, you forgot the last part of Surah 9, which is actually, it's it's really not very important. It's uh, the whole but of it is just this. I could make a case that it is important in yeah. a sense because the name of Allah is also will be used in the, for the name of Muhammad. So Muhammad shares the same name with Allah and of Surah 9. That's one of the reasons that um, Quran only Muslims don't have those two verses in their Quran. Oh, that's nice. It says, there has come to you a messenger from among yourselves to whom anything that distresses you is grievous, full of concern for you, for the believers, full of pity, merciful. Now, if they turn away, say Allah is sufficient for me. There is no God except him. In him I have put my trust, and he is Lord of the great throne. Now, why would Quran only believers not like that? They would. It seems like they would like Allah is sufficient for me. Uh, you know, they don't need no hadith. Allah is enough. No. Not in reality. Without, <laughs> without hadith, they wouldn't even now have to get the bathroom. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> I was going to put that nicely i'm sorry just sorry it's true though you're absolutely right though the rules are all there yeah um okay so uh we've got kind of serious questions on um how the quran is being compiled and then finally they compile the quran and is the quran which you expressed that allah was reading before he created everything is that the same Quran that Uthman compiled? And also Muslim think we've got like Allah's Quran, Uthman's Quran, and today's Quran, are they exactly the same? Is that what something Muslim thinks or is that wrong assumption? No, that's the, that's what that's what many of them think. And uh, then, of course, we have all the entertaining things that have been happening over the last few years, like uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi uh, on video saying, that not a single copy of the Quran is different from any other, and they're all perfect, and they are all exact copies of the original Quran, and then now admitting that there are variations and that there are holes in the narrative and so on. And so it's become impossible in the face of all the evidence for Muslims to sustain what used to be, up until quite recently, a very common argument among Islamic apologists that the Quran is always the same. And Every copy you pick up anywhere in the world under any circumstances is exactly the same as every other. That is the story that many Muslims have been told 
I'm sure many of them still believe it, even though some of the scholars and apologists have now been forced to be a little more honest. I'm sure this is what is taught to this day in madrasas all over the world, that uh, this is the perfect book that Allah revealed perfectly to Muhammad, who transmitted it perfectly, and then his followers perfectly wrote it down, and they perfectly collected it, and now we perfectly have it today in the perfect 1924 edition. And these were all are all the same as all the others. And so uh, the Christians, with all their variations in manuscripts, you see that's a sign that uh, uh, Allah is not protecting the Christian scriptures the way he's protecting the Quran. That's the line. But, of course, it's completely fictional. The In the first place, why would Allah, reading his perfect book in paradise, have seven different versions? He doesn't speak seven different kinds of arabic why does he have and, and if he doesn't have seven different versions then why did he give it in seven different versions it doesn't make any sense and if he does give it in seven different versions then is only one of them the perfect and eternal one and the others are are created later and this creates a lot of difficulties and of course the difficulties only multiply from there well, um, you are causing problem by causing doubts in the hearts of Muslims on that. Yes. Um, and it is not Allah's fault if he wants to practice his speaking in, in different dialects. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I'm just going to make Maybe a comment. he likes to do voice impressions. Maybe. maybe. Uh, like uh, uh, sometimes I do other accents and you have to be careful because it used to be everybody thought it was funny and now people get offended and think that you're making fun of the people which i never intended to do but maybe allah was uh, doing that and and making fun of uh, the other arabic dialects besides his own and so he made the quran in all these different versions that makes allah islamophobe yes uh, <laughs> causes cancer allah needs to watch out yes um so surah 9 verse surah 9 verse 128 regarding the comment i made i'll just back that up um in the chat so the verse finishes as he is concerned over you and to the believers is kind and merciful so the kind and merciful is the name of allah allah shares that name with um, or gives that name to muhammad if you check that with surah 9 verse 117 that will be helpful those who are kind of um was questioning on that on on that okay um so when i asked the question do muslims believe heavenly quran and the quran uh, muhammad received which utman compiled and today's quran is the same um actually i wasn't thinking about the different qurans in my mind was the abrogated verses but I'm guessing as we go on, we will be looking at that because there is like some problems on that. Yes, well, the abrogated verses presumably are always part of the Quran, that Allah wanted these verses to be given and then canceled for whatever reason. And of course, we have to understand what abrogation really is. Uh, it's, it's very important because many people have said to me, why don't you compile the Quran that has no abrogated verses. And they think that they're just canceled for all eternity. And so they have no purpose in the book. And that may be, that's actually the case for some. Like it's hard to understand why there would be the different verses about alcohol when alcohol is a work of Satan according to the last word on it. So why would Allah keep in the part where it says that it gives some benefit? something from satan gives some benefit it doesn't make any sense uh but when it comes to jihad that's the the abrogated verses are very important because mm -hmm. they are the verses of tolerance that are the first word of the quran on jihad that is later abrogated by the defensive jihad and the offensive jihad those passages still apply if Muslims are in the same situation as the Muslims were in Mecca in the early days of Islam. So if the Muslims are a small community that's weak and has no political or military power, then those verses are of tolerance apply again. 
So they can't be canceled altogether. And this is why we see in the West that when Muslims were a small group in the West, Islam taught, they would always say Islam is tolerant and peaceful. Now, when Muslims are gaining political power and are a larger group in the West, we see them now becoming more belligerent and saying, yes, we, we, we're going to take over. Yes, we're going to kill the apostates and so on. And this is this, the, the, this moving from one stage to the other as the Quran does from tolerance to defensive jihad to offensive jihad. And so it's not that there's no place for the tolerance. It's the place for the Muslim. It's the way Muslims should act when Islam is small and weak, as we have seen up until recently in the West, but no more. I was um, discussing with a Muslim regarding the uh, verses abrogated, the ones abrogated they are in the Quran, as well as the ones abrogated which is, didn't make into the Quran. And it was such a strange thing to see. Muslim had no problem at all for uh, like people who turn up on the road, uh, strangers to make a decision what abrogated verse needs to be in the Quran and what not. So as you expressed, jihad was important. Therefore, they had no problem to abrogate all the peace, peace verses with the, uh, really by the pieces verses. Um, yeah. Okay, anything else essentially we need to know before we dig into it? Probably it'll come up as we go along. Okay, good. Okay. Um, meantime, if those of you joining us in the chat, if you've got questions, please, please put um, ad sign in front of DCCI ministries and then drop them up. We can um, deal with them. Try to focus on the topic. If you can, um, that will be helpful and no distraction. Um, yes. Let's go, Robert. Okay, so uh, we talked about the completion of the Quran. Uh, we talked about uh, how like traditional account is not that trustworthy and current Quran we have. Uh, yeah. Many Muslims are following this and putting their life on it as well as taking the life of others because of this book. Um, Surah 1 is the first chapter. Um, what, what do we need to know about Surah 1? Well, this is the Fatiha, the opening. It is the most common prayer in Islam. And it is repeated 17 times. If you are a Muslim and you prayed the five daily prayers, then in the course of the five daily prayers, you will repeat this 17 times. And so it is very important. And uh, it is central to islam in a way probably no other prayer is and so it's interesting to note what it says i'll read the whole thing very quickly in the name of allah the compassionate the merciful praise be to allah the lord of the worlds the compassionate the merciful master of the day of judgment you do we worship you do we ask for help guide us to the straight path the path of those whom you have favored not of those who have earned your anger nor of those who have gone astray now, because there are uh, a lot of stupid infidels nowadays in the West, they invite imams to pray in places like uh, congressional meetings and various other meetings of representatives, town halls, that kind of thing. And it's very common for the imams to pray the Fatiha, the prayer that I just said. And people sit there, the non-Muslims, and they think, how nice, yes, guide us to the straight path the path of those whom you have favored, nor, not of those who have earned your anger or of those who've gone astray. Now, the path of those, the straight path, however, they don't know what the, that is the elected representatives who sit and listen to this when the imams pray it. What they don't know is that uh, the straight path is Islam, according to the Islamic scholars. And the path of those who have earned your anger is that of the Jews. And the path of those who have gone astray is that of the Christians. And so you have what is built into the Fatiha, the opening of the Quran, is the idea that Islam is superior to Judaism and Christianity. So these uh, imams go in front of Congress and, and, and all these places where 
uh, they're all these infidels thinking how wonderful and open-minded and ecumenical they're being. And they don't realize that the imam is actually saying that they are not on the straight path, but on the path of those who are on the way to hell because they have earned the anger of Allah or they have gone astray. Um, it is also um, when Muslims come to cathedrals and the churches, um, they recite the Surah Fatiha as well. It's um, it's very heartbreaking that um, Christians don't even kind of pick that up. Um, very disturbing, very disturbing. Yeah, they don't have any idea what's being said. They think that it's just a nice sentiment. Oh, yes, we want to be guided to the straight path. We don't want to be uh, astray. And so they don't know. For example, uh, let's see. I, I have it here somewhere in the small print. Um, I shouldn't have made this such small print. Actually, the publisher made it such small print. Sorry, folks. Okay. We had no control over that. Uh, uh, oh, here we go. Um, this is Bukhari, is it? That says, say ain't no. This is, oh yeah, and Muhammad says this according to a Bukhari hadith. Say yeah. amen when the imam says not on the path of those who earn your anger, such as Jews, nor of those who go astray, such as Christians. All the past sins of the person saying who's saying of Amin coincides with that of the angels will be forgiven. And there are many other scholars, I quote them here in the critical Quran, who say that those who have earned the anger of the Jews and those who've gone astray are the Christians. Ibn, Ibn Khatib does the same thing. Just a quick question. Yeah. So you express that Quran is the word of Allah. And as I am kind of reading this, uh, Allah is praising to himself. Allah yeah. is asking God, like, so how this needs to come across like as i'm reading i'm just like taking it as allah is just kind of talking to himself praising to himself asking him to be guided the straight path all those kind of things uh did i get that wrong no you're right allah is the speaker according to islamic theology of every bit of the quran and so if we think of allah as the speaker of every bit of the quran then we open the Quran and it says, praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world. It would be like me coming on your show and saying, praise be to Spencer. <laughs> it would be ludicrous. But we take it when it comes to Allah because we're used to his idiosyncrasies. But really it shows that this is a prayer that people would pray. And it was not supposed to be spoken by Allah. The idea that Allah spoke every word of the Quran is a later theological development that comes from other passages of the Quran that we'll get to that uh, says that every bit of it is something that he's saying. So the Fatiha gets added into the Quran, then it has to be explained away as being Allah maybe teaching people to pray or something like that. But really... It doesn't make any sense because you would think that he would have the courtesy or the uh, foresight to say, when you pray, pray this way or something like that, instead of just saying the prayer and you're confused because you don't understand why he's referring to himself in the third person. Um, so um, I've got a quick question. So you talked about verse six and seven. Guide us to the straight yeah. path, path of those whom you have favored, not those whom you whom have earned your anger, and of those who gone astray. So this is addressing to the uh, Christians and Jews. Yes, Christians. Uh, the Jews are in the anger. The Christians went astray. Yeah. So what did kind of Jews do to earn the anger? Like, what's wrong with Christians? Like, we follow the Bible, which Quran confirms. So what, what is the problem there? Well, do you want to get ahead of the game here? We're going to have to go into chapter 5 okay, uh, gotcha. and 9 and 61 and 19. Uh, all these things, the, the Quran says, of course, Jesus is not the Son of God, was not crucified, did not rise from the dead, is not the Savior, uh, is uh, only somebody who is bearing witness to the coming of Muhammad, all these things and more are in the Quran. And so 
the Christians have gone astray because they say Jesus is the Son of God. That's most clearly spoken in chapter 9, verse 30, that uh, it says the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, which no Jews ever said, but the Quran says it, so there must be some somewhere. And uh, the Christians say Jesus is the, uh, the, is the son of Allah, and so the, they are under the curse of Allah for saying this. And that's how the Christians have gone astray primarily. Also, of course, uh, the Quran says, say not three, cease, it will be better for you in chapter 19. And so that's uh, the idea of the Trinity. Although the Trinity is misstated in the Quran as Allah, Jesus, and Mary, instead of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is asked at the end of, of Surah 5 if he told his followers to take himself and Mary as other gods besides Allah. And of course, Jesus denies this uh, strenuously. And then uh, you have the uh, crucifixion that the Jews say that they have slain the Messiah, the son of Mary, and they did not kill or crucify him, but it seemed so to them in chapter 4, verse 157. So the Christians in uh, affirming that Jesus is crucified and is the son of God, these things all, and is one of the Trinity, this leads them astray. Okay, so that means simply having my core doctrine, what makes me Christian, according to Allah, according to Allah, gives right to Muslims to curse me in their daily prayer. Oh, yeah. Seven times a day. Chapter 5, verse 17, and again in 72, it says, unbelievers are those who say Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. And so if you affirm the divinity of Christ, you are an unbeliever. And then uh, you're under the curse of Allah, according to 930. And then you've gone astray here. Well, Allah could be doing lots of other useful things and saying lots of other useful things in his free time while he was sitting in that throne. But he chose to insult Christians and Jews. Not only that, he chose to put that hatred in the hearts of Muslims so that they can recite that 17 times a day. That means when I hear Muslims are in outside of the mosque where they are reciting Surah Fatiha from the cathedral to churches to the dinner places, that is not compliment to me. That is simply insult. Yes, that's very important to know that it's basic to Islam because this is as I said before, the basic prayer of Islam. And so it's repeated all those times every day, 17 times a day, they're repeating that their religion is superior to yours and that you are astray. And that the Jews have, are, Allah is angry with the Jews and the Christians are astray. There's no other religion that does this. The Christians' religion is not centered on talking about how the other people are all astray or under the curse of God. The, the Jews, in the same way, their religion is not about what the other people are doing. It's only Islam that its whole basic understanding of itself is based on being superior to everybody else, on rejecting the alleged errors of the other religions and defining themselves by means of the other religions. If there were no Jews or Christians, then Islam would be meaningless because the Quran is all about how the unbelievers are terrible and wrong and stupid and evil. And if there were no unbelievers, then what would the Quran be about? It wouldn't have anything to say. That's the only thing Allah seems interested in talking about. I used to do this, you know, Hatun, when I would speak very frequently out all around the country uh, and in Europe as well. And even in Britain, you know, before I became too dangerous, uh, the I, I would challenge if the, if the crowd was hostile, I would take the Quran that I had with me. I hadn't written the Quran yet. I had other Qurans. And I would take it and, and hold it out and say, here, take my Quran and open it anywhere, to any page, anywhere, and you will find a denunciation of the unbelievers. I challenge you to find a single page even just one page that does not have angry denunciations of unbelievers somewhere on it. And nobody ever could because there aren't any such pages. It's all about the unbelievers. That's what Islam is all about. 
it, it, it's very different. See, people talk about how the we have these wonderful Abrahamic religions and and they have the same God and so on. And one of the ways in which that is nonsense and evil nonsense is because Judaism and Christianity are about serving God. Now they have their own disagreements, there's no doubt. And they can't both be completely true in the sense that a lot of their believers think that they are. Uh, one of them has to be or not, or they're both false. But when it comes to Islam, it's not even about what it says. All it says is what it's not, that it's not Judaism. It's not Christianity. It's better than those things. And you're stupid and evil and wrong. And over and over again, this is repeated. So looking from just from human perspective, Quran acknowledges the reliability of the Bible, asks people to put their trust in the Bible. And that very Bible tells us in the beginning, triune God, who Father is loving the Son in the power of the Spirit, creates everything. And because of the rebellions of men and woman, God calls them to repent, but they don't repent. They continue to sin. They go behind um, after other gods and then they worship other gods. Yet God of Bible never gives up on his people. He calls them, he calls them, he calls them. As he calls more people, fa goes farther away. Mm -hmm. And that eternal son of the father steps in. Born as a child, he didn't turn up as a warrior or he turned up as a vulnerable child, lived among us as truly God-man and give himself on the cross and then said his death and his resurrection is the source of our eternal life. And today as a Christian, um, when we put our faith in him, we are declared righteous and we are not looking a place to go, but we are looking to be with someone when we start our eternal life. Yes. And as he shed his blood on the cross, he died by like very bloody dead. Uh, and he offers me eternal life. And then verses God of Islam steps in and then says, because they believe what the eternal son of father did for them, they've gone to stray. Therefore, by default, I deserve hell. Mm -hmm. If that's what they understand and, and if they choose to, uh, say curses towards Christians, it's up to them, but we see that as creator of universe loves us enough to do something for us and that something is perfect, gives eternal life. Um, if that kind of Islam thinks, oh, that's very bad, therefore they are identified as the people who go astray, let that be, but we rejoice that the son of God give himself for us. We rejoice that God has a son and his son died on the cross by crucifixion and walked out of that grave. That's such a shame that Allah doesn't even find the ways to see the love of that. Just heartbreaking. And same, of course, with the Muslims. Yes. And, well, it's very important to understand that when you think about it from the other side, it doesn't make any sense. In other words, that when you delineate the Christian message as you just did so well, then you have God who is love, who is reaching out in love and self-sacrifice, which is the essence of love to his cre creation versus Allah, the vision of Allah who is only concerned about punishing those who are wrong through no fault of their own, who actually do what he said since the Quran, as we will see, tells the Christians to rely on what's written in the gospel. And so he is making them wrong for something that he told them to do and punishing them accordingly on the basis of a misunderstanding or a number of misunderstandings, like with the Trinity and so on that I explained before. And uh, the, this is clearly something that cannot possibly be divinely inspired. Oh, and another thing is the textual variants, even in chapter one, that show that this is uh, 
a varying a varying text and not a perfect and eternal one. For example, uh, instead of praise be to Allah right at the beginning, praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, there is a Shiite scholar who says that uh, he has manuscripts that say, we greatly praise Allah. And instead of the compassionate, the merciful, there's a manuscript that says, the sustainer, the merciful, instead of master of the day of judgment, the Warsh Quran has king of the day of judgment. You had up here before which uh, one, I'm using the 1924 Quran here because it's obviously the most common one nowadays, but I note as many variants as I could that I thought were clear and easy for English speaking readers to understand. And so uh, there's no true text. They're just different fatihas. And so you just like give us three verses uh, how Shia Quran and Sunni Quran differs as yes. well as how within Sunni Quran it differs as well. And now you are saying actually we will never know which one is the true text or you are saying there is no true text. There's no true text. How could there possibly be? Well, there could be a true text if there were really an Allah and really a Muhammad and he really got the book. But if he did, then the, we wouldn't see these variations. That's why the story that they were able to tell all those years about uh, all the all the copies being the same, that's that was plausible because it makes sense in the within the universe of Islam. If Allah really is there, why wouldn't he reveal only one text and then protect it? And all the variants, they torpedo the whole narrative. Okay. Um, there is a um, comment on, as we were talking about, the um, how Arabic text needed dots to make sense of it. Um, there's a Mr. Muslim who expresses actually no, um, that's only for English speakers. Um, any it's comment? It's not just vowels. It's not just vowels. See, what Aga Abbas is not acknowledging here is that the problem is not just that the Quranic text has no vowels. That's true, but that's the easy part. The problem is, is that the Quranic text has variable consonants because so many Arabic letters are identical. I was showing before when Hatun put up the, the, the variant passage how you've got a kaf and a fa, a q and an f, and they're the same letter depending on if they have two dots or one dot, a Q has two dots and an F has one. And that's the only way you can tell. So if you've got neither one, you've got not one dot or two dot in the original manuscript, then you don't know if it's a Q or an F. And then the R and the Z are the same. And the B and the T and the Th, and you've got, and the S and the Sh, and you've got so many different things that are exactly the same letter that are distinguished only by the dots. You're being dishonest or disingenuous when you say Arabs don't need vowels. It's not, the vowels aren't the problem, the consonants are the problem. So there is an issue with the consonantal, and let's say, sake of the argument, they don't need dots, okay? Then why do we have Warsh Quran in Morocco, which speaks Arabic, Hafs Quran in Saudi Arabia, which speaks Arabic, and they are, uh, the, uh, your Muslim scholars are saying, this Quran is different, from this Quran and both of the Qurans are in Arabic. So those um, dots are important because it is not only for vowels, but it is also for consonantal letters. If you need basic Arabic class, ask uh, Muhammad Hijab, you might be able to help you or sign up Yasser Kadi's class. Angel Gabriel, he'll help you. And he couldn't help Muhammad. He's not gonna help Abbas, huh? Yeah. Somebody um, said in the chat there, I had to see this. I met your, oh, it's the same guy. I met your challenge. Read chapter 55 from the beginning, 1 to 40. There's no denunciation of unbelievers. But it, it's everywhere in the whole thing. I just turned to 55, and every other verse or every few verses, it's which of your Lord's favors do you deny? So even while Allah is pil is is is, is uh, writing all these things, he's, uh, Ar Rahman has made known the Quran. He has created man. He has taught him speech. The sun and the moon are made punctual. The stars and the trees adore, and the sky he has uplifted, and he has set the measure, etc., etc., etc. Even as he's listing all these blessings of creation, he's got his mind on the unbelievers. Which of your Lord's blessings will deny? Will, will you deny? It's in verse 13, verse 16, verse 18, verse 21. 23, 
25, 28, and so on and so on. And so he, the, the whole thing is a denunciation of unbelievers, that they are actually daring to deny all these blessings of Allah. So you, you fail the challenge. Sorry, buddy. And I find it interesting, the one he was looking, he simply went this very disturbing passage of Surah 55, but that's okay. Allah and his favors. Allah failed to do any favor at all. Um, okay. Any other thing we need to know about Surah Fatiha? Well, there is plenty uh, that we could talk about, but time is growing short. We could, this, this kind of series, Hatun, it could go on forever. You know, it, yeah. we would be doing the Quran a disservice, and we certainly don't want to do that just to have 114 episodes. <laughs> Yeah, because, yeah, you are just being Islamophobe by respecting Quran more than Muslims. Yes, because for example, you know, we're going to go into the cow now, chapter two, and uh, that's 286 verses. Uh, we can't possibly cover all that in an hour. Yeah, I think we like so we're going to have to do this, take our time on this, and do it right. But yeah, I think that's a that's a good uh, beginning for the Fatiha. And the, now the, the opening, the Quran has been opened, and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. Um, there is a personal question for you. Uh, would you like to share your opinion about Serbian Orthodox Christian brothers? I don't know exactly what you're asking. I mean, I love my Serbian Orthodox Christian brothers. Uh, what else? Is there some controversy going on that I don't know about? Probably, because there usually is, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not aware of it. I'm sorry. That is beautiful cathedral in um, Serbia, um, San Save. Uh, do go there if anyone is in that area. Yes. Um, okay. Um, I think we finish uh, Surah 1 here, and then by God's grace, we will pick up next week and then go through a whole of the Quran. Uh, meantime, um, if you've got like questions um, come to your mind, put them in the uh, chat. I'll pick them up and then bring them up to uh, Robert Spencer or the author, or author of the Quran next time when we meet. So we make sure that uh, he's better than Allah and is able to answer your questions and he doesn't kick you out because you ask him questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, you know, Surah 5 verses 101 and 102 says, uh, don't ask questions because people have lost their faith asking questions. And so that just means ask questions all the more here. Um, anyway. Oh, that's true. You're right, Milos. We Serbs and Greeks shared the same struggles under the Ottoman Empire when Hatun was oppressing us. But she, she she's she's over now. now. Now we are brothers and sisters who are going to spend eternity together. Yes. And, uh, yes. Turkey needs to acknowledge the genocide they committed, and they need to deal with it. Yes. Um, thank you very much for joining me and unpacking the word of Allah for us. Um, and thank you very much, everyone in the chat who joined us. By God's grace, we will see you again. Until we see you, may Christ crucified silent you with his love. Have a good evening. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.